and it appears that that number continues to rise as we get more prosperous as a society, um, that we ought to, we ought, a component of a See, multimodal you, system ought to the, have good roads. If the Denver Post said <clears throat> that spending 55% of our transportation dollars on the 2% mileage that we get on, on, on uh, transit, we should actually give them the 2% they carry and spend 98% of our money improving the roads, uh, there would be a, 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 a witch a great hunt. hue and cry. Why? <laughs> Why? Doesn't that make more sense, though? Because if that's the environmental problem... I wonder if there's a way to split the difference and not, not cast it I would be it thrilled quite. to split the difference. <laughs> I would be thrilled okay. if it stopped. But the idea that we're spending 55% of our money to solve a 2% issue is insane. Well, Over the here. percentages aren't really important. What really it counts is where's the money coming from. Because if you know that your money is, is limited, you're going to act in a responsible way. And if, you, if your money is coming from the users... The users are paying for the, the service you're providing, whether it's roads or transit or whatever, you're going to serve those users. But if the money is coming from general taxpayers, and if, if, if you're RTD, for example, and 80% of your money comes from taxpayers and only 20% comes from users, to heck with the users. You want to please the taxpayers by having them showing them, gee whiz, kind of uh, projects that they're never harming. And, and, and RTD, ride. when you put in um, capital and operating, it's about 90% government subsidized. All right, let me beat up you from the conservative side. You guys like congestion pricing, the idea that instead of paying at a gas tax or a sales tax when you buy a cup of coffee, you ought to pay for the road when you use the road, have that price be variable, so when it's tra heavy traffic, you pay more to use this road, thus discouraging people. It's a market mechanism. A lot of, a lot of quote, free market people despise that idea. They're not ready. They pay their taxes. They want the road to be there you want to charge me for the road when, when I use it. Well, the interesting thing about congestion pricing is that we're using, really wanting to use it to make more effective use of our roads. If, if you've got free-flowing traffic down a freeway, you can move 2,000 vehicles per hour on each lane of that freeway. But once you start getting stop-and-go traffic, you're down to 1,000 cars an hour. So if you have a demand during peak you know, 9 o'clock in the morning, 8.30 in the morning, a demand for 2,100 cars per hour, suddenly you can only move 1,000 cars because you can't go. It jams up very it jams quickly. It up. So you suppress the demand just a tiny bit to get it down to 2,000 with the user fee, and then suddenly you can have 2,000 cars going instead of just 1,000. You at, doubled at, your throughput. At full speed, and, at those, full speed. and those vehicles yeah. could be high-capacity buses. They, you can have people. buses, and the, those buses could move a lot more people than any light rail line. And, and for instance, the Boulder to Denver bus run is one of the most successful in the country, and it's fast and it's great, and I've used it many, many times, and it, and, and it works. But we users don't want to pay for it that way. We like paying in that, you know, keep it in the shadows. Pay for it in the, your gas tax or your sales tax. Is this something where left and right can meet on, on, on congestion pricing? And my guess is it's going to be the right that's going to have a harder time accepting it. I bet you're right. I, I, I think once you start looking at something like congestion pricing, it makes a lot of sense. Um, I, I, would, I wouldn't mind paying a little bit more to go faster to get home. Well, I live in the north where you can use the HOT lane. It works like a beauty, and I'm glad I've got that. My wife and I carpool, and we use an HOT lane very often. There it's you go. a wonderful thing. No one's in it. We just shoot right down. You hippie liberal. <laughs> All right. In, in, in a Honda Civic. In a, oh. Oh. Greatly <laughs> outstripping the environmental impact of uh, fast tracks. You don't have a Prius? On you. <laughs> All right. Let, we've got about five minutes left. One of your ideas for the future is something that was developed in the past, and I've got to tell you, even I have a hard time imagining the technological breakthroughs we're going to need to get to, to where you, a car-hating, rail-loving, bicycling <laughs> environmentalist, uh, uh, want, want to bring us. Is this, tell me about it. Well, uh, back in the 90s, the U.S. Department of Transportation funded uh, research to develop driverless cars so that you could get in your car and say, there's like, there's like Take five female driver jokes I could go right like that, but I'm going to let them all fly. And what they found is they developed technologies to make it possible for driverless cars to go down freeways at 65 miles an hour, practically bumper to bumper. Instead of 2,000 cars an hour, you can fit 8,000 cars an hour down that freeway lane. Because if, if, if you've got cars moving at a fast speed and they're very close to each other, which my driving ed teacher back in high school would, <laughs> would kill me for, um, you can get a lot more cars on the, on the freeway. That's right. And the cars can you know, monitor each other and have faster reaction times 
and uh, uh, so there won't, it'll, st it'll still be safe, even though they're only one car length apart instead of six car lengths apart. So all this research was done in 1997. They had successfully t demonstrated the research, and the Department of Transportation canceled the project. But they had a successful demonstration. But it was a successful we've got, we've demonstration. Got the videotape of uh, you know, ten cars yeah. flying without any drivers in them. Exactly. So. Right now, the auto industry is doing the research, and that's not bad. It's great that they're doing it. Uh, Volkswagen, for example, this summer plans to run an Audi at racing speeds to the pop, top of P Pikes Peak without a driver. So we've got the technology. The problem is the, the states own the highways, and we need to get the states on board and saying, okay, let's start turning these highways into driverless highways. Now, so let's let's just say uh, let me let me I'll put out the the objections of course in a second. But so what you're saying is one we can price the roads differently so we get more capacity out of them. But even beyond that, we can get more capacity out of the roads we have through using technology where cars right. can we can get <coughs> cars closer together going quickly. Do you really buy this technology? Are you going to put Absolutely. your life into this car? Absolutely. I mean, we already put our life. Uh, at the mercy of computers every time we get in a car, because almost every car today has computers controlling the electronic fuel injection. Most new cars have computers controlling the brakes. They've got computers even controlling the steering. So we're already relying on computers, and they work. They don't, if you, if you have a Macintosh, if you had a Macintosh like I did, you wouldn't worry <laughs> as much as those people who have windows. Uh, they work. All right, let me bring it over here. I have a feeling, let, let's, let's take, uh, take it at face value. We're going to have driverless cars, and I actually have seen a lot of the German cars now that are driving themselves amazingly. It, it, it's mind-blowing. Let's say that becomes reality in the next decade, that you can tell your car with GPS, it tell, tells you where to go. Why do I have a feeling there's a lot of environmentalists who are going to fight this because it means more cars? And cars in general mean people can live out in the burbs and, and have more land. Well, I don't know that I can buy the idea that that, that would ever be accessible to American drivers. That people, that, that, that drivers you, could, cars. you would trust driverless cars. Uh, it, it's, I think it's fascinating that, that Randall came up with this, or that he thinks about it because he, he does like trains. And it's almost like you've created the, the train system of the 21st century. I mean, it, it's, it's cars linked literally one to one to one, flying along at good speeds, except that they're so smart that they can divert and do all that. But do you like anyone to drive you? Usually when you're in the car, don't you like to feel like you're in control? It just seems it's like because a, you it's, and I have testosterone, <laughs> me a whole lot more than you, but this bicycle riding, train loving guy is willing to give his life over to, to a Macintosh. You, you, talk to me about making, making the, we've only got a minute left, making the societal change. Assuming the technology is there, this is, this is something us old geezers aren't going to go for. It's the young geezers are going to like it. Well, for, for at least the next couple of decades, what we're going to see is mixed traffic. We're going to see driverless cars in the same traffic as driver-operated cars. And so eventually, people are going to realize, even people who have testosterone, are going to realize that the driver, driverless cars are so much better that they can do so many other things while the car is moving that they're going to be willing to go along with it. It's going to be interesting. All right. You just wish you had my testosterone. The book <laughs> is Gridlock. Go to Amazon.com or Cato.org. Listen for me late nights on 850-KOA. By all means, tell a friend about the Independence Institute. We'll see you next week. You jibber jab, bamboozle, nuke a noozle, bippity pop, she called. You jibber jab, bamboozle, nuke a noozle, bippity pop, she called. But you don't know where to turn it off.